The modernists in the Vatican are quietly panicking. In light of yesterday's announcement by the United States Department of Justice that it would be looking into the cover-up of sex abuse cases in Pennsylvania, and that they would specifically be looking into allegations that both perpetrators and victims were moved across state lines, it is evident that the wheels of the modernist revolution in the church are finally beginning to come off after 50 years. And that panics the Vatican, for the leadership of the church, from Francis down to the local bishops and archbishops in the majority of the dioceses in the Western world, adhere to some degree to their ideology. That ideology has had real consequences in the lives of Catholics and non-Catholics alike in innumerable ways. Yet the leadership refuses to back down, slighting whistleblowers and anyone who objects with the ugliest of smears. It'd be laughable if the consequences weren't so dire. As evidence of this, the media affiliates of the occupied church are in full defense mode by playing the best form of defense, offense. And one of the more skilled propagandists of the media arm of the occupied church is Massimo Fagioli, or Mr. Bean as I sometimes call him for his uncanny resemblance to the BBC character, who has taken it upon himself to write apologetics for Francis's furthering of the conciliar revolution in the church. The following article is from Commonweal Magazine. Who's Rome? Burke, Bannon, and the Eternal City by Mr. Bean, October 18th, 2018. The Catholic opposition to Pope Francis is headquartered in the United States. It is a minority within the U.S. Church, but it is well organized. Its main intellectual organ is first things. Its Episcopal leader is Archbishop Chaput. Oh, really? But just as a 19th century European ultramontanist looked beyond the Alps to Rome, this movement is looking beyond the Atlantic. Besides the sympathetic Catholic journalists who spread Archbishop Vigano's testimony in scare quotes on August 27th, there are also more overtly partisan leaders of this movement, such as Cardinal Raymond Burke and Steve Bannon, Donald Trump's former chief strategist. Burke and Bannon are collaborating on a new right-wing Roman Catholic organization in Rome, the Dignitatis Humanae Institute. Bannon is one of its leaders. Burke is president of its board of advisors. The Institute has been described by its founders, founders as an academy for the Judeo-Christian West. Do you see what he's doing here in the first paragraph? He's linking Cardinal Burke to that scary, scary person the U.S. media has uh, declared to be a fascist, Steve Bannon, and of course putting in Donald Trump, who the media has already declared to be a hyper-racist, uh, literally Hitler-type figure. Bear this all in mind as we progress. The growing influence of these conservative American Catholics in Rome has something to do with the formation of a new xenophobic and populist Italian government, about which Bannon and Burke are both enthusiastic. And the esteem is mutual. A few weeks ago, the Cardinal was invited by members of the new political elite to speak at the Italian Senate. But the Dignitatis Humanae Institute is also a reaction against the Pontificate of Francis and an affirmation of a particular idea of the relationship between the city of Rome and the Catholic Church. The latest attempt by tr Catholic traditionalists to recapture Rome for their cause reminds us of the two biggest crises for the papacy in the 20th century, both arising in France, Action Francais in the 1920s and the Society of St. Pius X in the 1970s and 1980s. He's literally throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, at Steve Bannon and Cardinal Burke and seeing if anything will stick. Let's continue. In a speech delivered during an audience at the French Seminary in Rome on April 9th, 1927, Pius XI talked about Action Francais in terms of a strange Romanita and a still stranger Catholicism. Just a few months before, on December 26, 1926, Pius XI had formally condemned Action Francais, a, condem a condemnation that lasted until 1939 and put the movement's newspaper and the writings of its leader, Charles Maurras, on the Vatican's official list of prohibited books. Of course, nobody wishes or expects Francis to first things EWTN or Breitbart News on a new index of forbidden media. The old index ceased to exist in 1966. But certainly a strange Romanita is part of this right-wing brand of American Catholicism mobilized against Francis. This is a repeat of the lie that this is that the backlash against Pope Francis is only an American issue. Just ignore the same-sex sexual predation done by priests and the cover-up that targeted seminarians and children. But let's continue some more. There are some striking similarities between the 1920s and the current moment. Action Francais was a form of Gallicanism, or ecclesial nationalism. 
Its idea of Catholicism was more tribal and political than mystical. A philosopher, Etienne Gilson, put it, They are very interested in Rome, but have no interest in Jerusalem. This is an interesting accusation that they're already bringing up here, keeping in mind that this is the pontificate that is decentralizing things and putting more power into the hands of the national conferences as per the Arecibo Conference. Just keep that in mind. For Action Francais, it was the church as an institution and political power that mattered, not the gospel. Wow, do these get people look in a mirror? This is why they could simultaneously celebrate the majesty of Rome and revile a pope whose teachings they found inconvenient. In fairness, it should be noted that just as the right-wing movement represented by Burke and Bannon does not speak for all conservative Catholics in the United States, Action Francais did not represent the entire spectrum of conservative Catholicism in France. Some Catholic monarchists distrusted Maras, just as some doctrinally conservative American Catholics consider Bannon an opportunist. Pius XI's 1926 condemnation of Action Francais had more to do with its political ideology than with its theological message, which remained somewhat vague. In any event, the condemnation had its intended effect. After 1926, the movement splintered. Some of its intellectual elite left the church, while others had an intellectual and philosophical conversion leading them back to Rome. And now this is where he brings in the boogeyman of the SSPX. The case 50 years later of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and his Society of St. Pius X was somewhat different. Lefebvre subscribed to a Gallican ultramontanism, a very strong idea of Rome's authority mixed with a French-centered sense of the church. In Lefebvre's view, Rome had, betra had been betrayed by Vatican II. Lefebvre had his own political baggage. He had been a bishop in colonial French Africa and remained nostalgic about the Vichy regime. Ooh, literally calling him a Nazi sympathizer. Nicely done, Mr. Bean. But his differences with the, the Vatican, unlike those of Maras, were theologically ra theological rather than the political. Pope Paul VI was adamant in defending the Council's liturgical reforms, and Lefebvre believed those reforms would destroy the Church. And who's proven right so far? Let's noodle that one for a while. There are important similarities between each of these two episodes and the current wave of U.S.-based right-wing opposition to Pope Francis. Just ignore all the... All the more left-wing Catholics that I see on social media also demanding answers. But I digress. One is a blurring of the distinction between theology and politics. The opposition to Francis begins with a few moral issues, marriage and the family, homosexuality, the death penalty, but it quickly expands to include critics of Francis's teachings on the economy, the environment, and immigration. For Bannon and his ilk, politics always comes first. And I'll let you read the rest of that article yourself. The link is in the description below. It seems that, the, that some in the Vatican feel threatened by Steve Bannon and Cardinal Burke's work. I'm sure it has nothing to do with the swelling attendance at traditional parishes in the United States and broader West, while the hippie Novus Ordo Missae celebrating parishes look more and more like retirement homes with every passing week. And I'm sure it has nothing to do with the funds being cut off from wealthy so-called conservative donors in the U.S. and West in the wake of the sex abuse crisis and cover-up. And I'm sure it has nothing to do with the sudden realization on the part of many Catholics that the timeless teachings of the church and the pillar of sacred tradition are being undermined in the name of something the modernists call a living tradition, an oxymoron if there ever was one, for tradition is something unchanging, while the term living tradition suggests that the traditions of the church should be adapted or forgotten to conform to the age. This worldview fails because it does not take into account the words of the author of the letter to the Hebrews. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Any truth that ceases to be true because of the calendar ceases to be true at all. It becomes mere fashion, and the Vatican today is peddling fashion. This is no more evident than in the words of one cardinal archbishop at the Synod on the undermining of the family in Rome. But the uh, problem of the young is of interest to the entire church. We need to understand what sort of church we wish to be if we are able to dream with this uh, great effort of uh, looking to the future with hope. Then for the young, too, there will be many possibilities and the church won't be something that's distant and obsolete and uh, difficult to understand and legalistic. but um, it will be something in which they can be protagonist in a logic of communion. Thank you, Your Excellency. But why are they, through media puppets like Fagioli, attacking B Bannon and Burke? 
Let's take a look at the work Bannon is doing with Cardinal Burke for some insight. From Reuters, published September 18th, 2018. Steve Bannon, Drafting Curriculum for Right-Wing Catholic Institute in Italy by Mark Hosenball. Former Trump White House advisor Steve Bannon is helping to craft the curriculum for a leadership course at a right-wing Roman Catholic Institute in Italy, stepping up his efforts to influence conservative thinking in the church. Benjamin Harnwell, director of the Dignitatis Humanae Institute, based in a mountaintop monastery not far from Rome, told Reuters Bannon had been helping to build up the institute for about half of its eight-year life. Cardinal Raymond Burke, a leading Vatican conservative who is president of the Institute's Board of Advisors, said Bannon would be playing a leading role there. Burke told Reuters he looked forward to working with Harnwell and Bannon to promote a number of projects that should make a decisive contribution to the defense of what used to be called Christendom. Bannon's increased engagement with the Institute demonstrates how his involvement in Europe extends beyond electoral politics to an effort to, pull, to build a populist faction inside the Catholic Church. Bannon told Reuters this week that after November 6th congressional elections in the United States, he will spend 80 to 90 percent of his time in Europe building up his Brussels-based populist movement. Bannon, who has visited the Institute's home at the 800-year-old Monastery of Trisulti and addressed the organization by video link, is helping to draw up the coursework for a training program for conservative Catholic political activists and leaders, Harnwell said. And that is why they feel threatened by this, because these are Catholics who will be in the political system who will reject the line coming from the Vatican. This line about open borders, this line about inc uh, increased technocratic rule on an international and, yes, global level. This anti-Catholic line coming from the Vatican. But let's continue. Bannon is also raising funds for the Institute in both Europe and the United States, he added. The Institute has set very high academic standards, Harnwell said. Harnwell, a former European Parliament staffer, also is, also is advising Bannon on his campaign to build a populist movement across Europe that will support far-right, quote-unquote, parties in next year's European Parliament elections, he and Bannon said. Beware of buzzwords like far right. They're, they're meant, they are meant to invoke images of jackbooted thugs goose stepping down the, in the streets of Berlin. Don't let them do that to you. Bannon and the Vatican did not immediately respond for requests for comment on this story. Harnwell said he found the Institute while wor working as an aide to a British conservative European Parliament member. At the time, one of the legislature's committees was trying to block Rocco Buttiglione, a confidant of Pope John Paul II, from becoming European Commissioner, Commissioner for Justice and Security. During a confirmation hearing, Buttiglione, who was nominated to the European Commission by then Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi, described homosexuality as a sin and said the principal role of women was to have children. Amid political uproar, Buttiglione withdrew from consideration for the commission. Harnwell said, Buttiglione was a founding patron of the Dignitates Humanae Institute, whose mission he described as defending the Judeo-Christian tradition and promoting human dignity based on the image of God. Harnwell added, if you don't have a culture of religious principle, we no longer have a credible basis for life. And there is nothing wrong with anything they said there. That is all traditional Catholicism. It's the traditional gender arrangements, traditional family life, traditional Catholicism to a T outside of the theologies of the faith. That is why they feel threatened. One of the consistent things I've said since I started covering this mess back in July was that the crisis in the church is an issue of the church having become worldly. Since the 1960s, we've seen the church embracing the errors of the world with greater frequency, with calls for technocratic and political solutions to problems that the church has traditionally avoided commenting on until a theological or moral error was evident in an existing practice. For an example of this, I will upload a papal encyclical from before the council that addresses social, social concerns, but does so after the issue had long since existed, with the emphasis on moral relations. Stay tuned for that. That should be up on Saturday. What threatens the Vatican is the absolute rejection of that approach by the promotion of authentic Catholicism in the public sphere. When the new Italian populist coalition government, because it's not, just, it's not purely right-wing or left-wing, when that government came into office, they promoted the placing of crucifixes in public spaces again. Some objected, citing a separation of church and state. And among those objecting was the Vatican, despite the actions of the Italian, Italian government actually being in keeping with preconciliar notions of the faith in the public square. 
And let's not leave out the scare factor here either. Mr. Bean and the Catholic media, by promoting a story on essentially a think tank, is trying to undermine the resistance to the errors we see being promoted by trying to invoke Donald Trump and Steve Bannon and all of the associations those figures have that have largely been manufactured by the secular atheistic socialist media. This story is a distraction from the sex abuse cover-up, the abuse of seminarians, and the synod on the undermining of the family going on in Rome right now. Do not take your eyes off that hot mess and pray for the liberation and exaltation of the church. If you like videos like this, like and share this video and subscribe, and click that notification bell below. I can be found on Twitter and Facebook with links in the description. For Return to Tradition, I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.